right, settle in, people. We have a special feature for you today. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm going to try not to fanboy out here. Gina Abrams and her Stacker Chat series has taken YouTube by storm. I know every week I'm on the edge of my seat waiting for the latest episode, and I could probably listen to Munib wax poetic about stacks all day, all day long. These bite-sized little interviews are the place to go if you want the stacks tea. Okay, I mean, this is going to be epic. I'm talking Obama Letterman, Frost Nixon, Oprah Prince Harry. Today we have the special treat of the first ever live in-person Stacker Chat with the Stacker Chat queen herself, Gina Abrams. Give it up, give it up for her. <laughs> and Stack's daddy himself, Muneeb Ali. Welcome then to the stage. All right, I, I love Joe's energy. He's, he's amazing. <laughs> it's gonna be a all of our hype person. Well, it's great to see everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, today we're gonna talk about Bitcoin DeFi and um, sort of why it is being built and what folks are doing with it. Um, so I think the question that everyone always starts with is: Do Bitcoiners want to participate in DeFi? Do they want to deploy their capital into smart contracts? Yeah, uh, I think I think before we get into it, given this is the first time we're doing this live, I want to say thanks to everyone who showed up for this event. Like it, it's amazing to see so many familiar faces. Sometimes like you talk to people uh, online or video calls, but you know, getting together in person and actually exchanging ideas and brainstorming and just like seeing how much this ecosystem has grown, like that's just tremendous. Like I think I, I'll definitely go back. Uh, from the event, like super energized, at least for the next one year, and then th then we have to do it again. So, uh, go coming back to why would people want to use it, I think it's it's very interesting. Like if you look at how Bitcoin is designed, Bitcoin has the coin base rewards, and then the transaction fees. And at some point, like whenever the halvings happen, the coin base rewards come down. So over the next couple of decades, uh, coin base rewards are going to disappear and transaction fees are supposed to take over. Right? And transaction fees, uh, for them to be meaningful, uh, these has to be high value transactions. Like if I'm, you know, this is the thing that I think people confused a lot in the early days of Bitcoin, that they thought that Bitcoin is uh, for direct payments. Like you were, like they were talking about buying coffee with Bitcoin. Like, and, and that's, I think there's still a misconception out there because Bitcoin is a settlement layer. Like think of that as a global reserve currency but also a global uh, settlement layer. And people should be doing like really high value transactions on Bitcoin. So it doesn't make sense for me if I'm buying like, you know, $5 worth of coffee to pay uh, when, when the fees were high, like $40, $40 in, in transaction fees, right? And Bitcoin block space like right now is fairly underutilized. And that's partly because a lot of the activity in DeFi, uh, NFTs and other types of use cases basically ended up happening outside of Bitcoin. And we are, we are, we're trying to change that because in the, in the long run, you wanna be on the blockchain that's the most decentralized, that's the most secure, and Bitcoin by far is that, right? So in terms of like, why would uh, people use DeFi on Bitcoin? I would reverse the question. I would basically say that uh, these types of use cases is what going to keep incentives alive for Bitcoin mining in the long term. Right? We are fine for like several decades, but the coin-based rewards are going to go away. Right? And if you look at the type of uh, gas fees that people are spending on, on Ethereum, these are usually, um, you know, the biggest gas, uh, gas guzzlers are Uniswap or OpenSea and, and, and so on. Right? If, you, if you look at what people are doing there, uh, they're doing very timely transactions. So if I'm making a swap, it is important to me that, if, uh, that I get my transaction in like very, very quickly. Same with like NFT sales and, and, and so on. So imagine like the market will set the price for what type of gas fees people are willing to, to, uh, to pay. And the Bitcoin, like I wouldn't be surprised if getting your transaction into the Bitcoin blockchain like 20 years from now would be a very, very expensive uh, uh, transaction. And I think that's fine because you would only do like really high value transactions 
uh, for example, Stacks miners, when they're settling data uh, on Bitcoin, uh, they're incentivized, right? They're willing to pay extremely high transaction fees uh, because of the incentives on the, uh, on the other side of it, right? So that's, that's one part. The other part is when you think about, uh, you know, what's, what's a good form of money, uh, Bitcoin is sound money, and a lot of people feel very comfortable owning Bitcoin. Like uh, a lot of other assets out there, people are a little bit like speculating on them or they own them for other reasons uh, than long-term savings. Like I personally feel more comfortable keeping my long-term savings in Bitcoin. And this used to be a crazy position to take in like 2013, right? Like people would laugh that this crazy grad student has his entire, entire uh, net worth in Bitcoin and basically like cashes out. But in this day and age, like when people have also almost like started to feel inflation, like on a, uh, on a regular basis, I think in, G in Germany, um, there, a report came out that the food prices are going up anywhere between 20 to 50%, right? So when people start feeling that their, uh, their local currency is actually losing value, they start looking for other, other things, right? So if, if a lot of uh, capital is basically going to move into Bitcoin, uh, the, the capital is not gonna just keep sitting there. Right. It's a, the very next logical thing is once you have a lot of capital as Bitcoin, uh, what can you do with it? Like, how do you deploy that? This is how capital markets are structured. Like, imagine when uh, people are putting a lot of USD in their savings account, banks don't keep your money in the savings account, right? They actually deploy it on your be on your behalf, but they don't give you anything in return, right? So the the what the returns that you get on from banks banks is like hilarious, or like it's hilariously low because they are the middlemen who are making all the money. But with Bitcoin, uh, because you own it, and you can decide what type of risk you're willing to take or not willing to take by participating in Bitcoin DeFi, at some point people will figure out that, you know, I'm not gonna just like keep my Bitcoin lying around. I will I'd rather make it productive at whatever risk level that I, I feel comfortable with and then deploy my Bitcoin that way. So it's a little bit like Bitcoin DeFi is going to happen because of the extremely high confidence level I have in Bitcoin winning as, as sound money. Right, so the next step is just very, very logical. Like if the first happens, second, second is just, just a matter of time. Absolutely. And you know, there's a lot of DeFi projects that have taken off not in the Bitcoin ecosystem. But when we're thinking about Bitcoin being this settlement layer, can you talk a little bit more about the advantage of it in terms of from the decentralized perspective, you know, what does that, what security guarantees does that bring to a project? No, I think that's a, that's a, that's a great question. So if you look at, uh, if you look at kind of like, you know, take a step back, look at what's happening in the industry, uh, you'll notice that, you know, Bitcoin uh, is, is gaining adoption and it used to be like a joke like years ago, like uh, most of the bankers or, or uh, policymakers would just laugh at Bitcoin, right? And it, it's, it's reaching a stage where it can no longer be, be ignored, right? Even if you're running for Congress, uh, if you're a politician, now like you have a massive advantage if you're pro-Bitcoin or if you're if you understand these technologies, uh, it, like you basically get a massive, mass, massive following and base and, and so on, right? So it's already reaching a stage where it can no longer be ignored. But before Bitcoin actually, uh, actually wins, uh, this, is, this is like where um, it, it, it's, a, it's a sad thing, but it's likely going to happen, uh, is there is going to be a massive, almost like a crackdown on, on these technologies, right? Like once, once the establishment and the governments actually realize how powerful these things are. We're, we're in, a, in a blind spot and almost like a bliss right now, right? Like they, they, don't, they don't truly believe that this is going to disrupt things at the, at the level that they, these things are going to disrupt the things, right? And it will be pretty much like, I think the closest thing uh, to that is going to be the crypto wars of the early 90s, where a lot of the uh, government organizations turned actively against the use of encryption and so on. And I think, I think the, the, the best chance that Bitcoin has is to become large enough uh, before like that type of a crackdown really, really starts to happen, right? So what happens, like, so this is, this is my theory that before any, any, any of the crypto industry becomes really, really big, like I'm talking about massive scale where Bitcoin can actually be a reserve currency of the world in, in, inside of the US dollar, there is going to be some sort of a crackdown. What happens in a crackdown, right? If your system is centralized, it is very easy to disrupt it. Like if, if there is, is a cryptocurrency and there is like one or two companies behind it and you can have a court order to basically go and say like, you know, shut down all of these servers, yeah, it's illegal now to actually run it, 
it's actually extremely easy to, to crack down on a lot of, lot of like, you know, newer L1 blockchains. It's actually not that hard. Like there are, there are a handful of people you can go after and you can actually massively disrupt a network. How would you shut down Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is, is by far has the best chance of surviving a, a, an environment like that, right? And I think that's the reason where decentralization matters. Like, and, and, and similarly, if you're settling uh, a lot of you know, high value transactions on a blockchain that where those transactions could be reversed, like that is the absolute thing that you never, never, never want to happen, right? So your confidence level that something, you settle the transaction on Bitcoin and Bitcoin is not gonna, be, not gonna change, Bitcoin is gonna be here like decades from now, your confidence level is very, very high, right? So I think that it's, a, it's a little bit like, I, I'm not saying it's perfect, but it is by far the best shot that we have so far. Great, thank you. So can you give a quick lay of the land in terms of where we are with Bitcoin DeFi today and essentially the, the ecosystem unlocks that you'd like to see to bring it to the next level? Yep, so I think uh, obviously like just a year ago or a year, year and uh, four months ago, the Stacks uh, blockchain went live and I think it, it has at least sparked this discussion. Right? And obviously, we have a very enthusiastic community. People who are actually using these things, they're kind of like living in the future a little bit, right? But it has sparked that discussion in the broader uh, Bitcoin community and when people are talking about like, you know, what, what type of um, applications are possible or, or what are the other, other types of solutions that can be used. Like for example, you know, Lightning just announced their, their protocol yesterday. It's basically like an asset transfer protocol. So what you can do is you can define other types of assets on the Bitcoin chain in a sort of like a compact way, and then you can transfer them on Lightning, which is, which is very powerful, uh, but it doesn't have smart contracts. So anything that you wanna do, like if you wanna build an automated market maker, uh, like Uniswap, or you wanna build a NFT marketplace like, like OpenSea, you need both a global ledger and uh, a fully expressive smart contracts for that, right? But so these technologies can be complementary uh, to each other as well, but what's happening is that I feel like the aver general awareness is increasing a lot in, in the Bitcoin community uh, in terms of like what's possible, what can be built. I think with Bitcoin, the, the main kind of like difference is that because Bitcoin was not originally designed uh, to have smart contracts, which I, I completely agree with that design decision, right? Like, let me, let me uh, actually take a little bit of a detour into a topic, but I think it's, it's important to understand that. Basically, the biggest difference between uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum is what I call kind of like a two-layer approach versus a single-layer approach, where the base layer on the Bitcoin side is very, very simple, and the base layer on the Ethereum side is more complex. And it's not just me uh, saying that, I think Vitalik uh, wrote a post very recently, maybe a couple of weeks ago, where he talks about the past five years of design decisions and what they could have done differently or what they got right and what they got wrong. And the conclusion of the post is basically that Ethereum has a choice to make. Should it become more simple, like Bitcoin? Or should it be more complex and more experimental, uh, like, like on the path that it has already been on, right? And what we're saying is there's a natural tension between the two things. Right. You could, you could either, either be one or the other. And being a money layer, you're much better suited to be simple and durable. Like nothing changes, the protocol is simple, it just does one thing, and, and that works. For a smart contract layer, you have to be complex and you kind of like have to be more experimental because you want new and new features. Like even in Clarity, we are, we are introducing new features and, 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 and we want to do that. So the, how to resolve that tension uh, is to have a two-layer solution where you have Bitcoin as the simple layer and then Stacks as the programming layer that is, is more complex. So I, I, I still stand behind our design because I think in the long term, we've actually resolved the tension that Ethereum is, is, is facing today, right? And, and I think that is, that is the thing where uh, the use cases that are going to come with, with Bitcoin DeFi, and, and obviously that required more plumbing, right? Because we, are, we have to work with Bitcoin, uh, we're still kind of like working on uh, unlocking like better connection to Bitcoin, more liquidity with Bitcoin, but those are engineering challenges. I think those, that, that, that can be figured out. On very long time horizons, I think it's the high level decisions that matter in terms of like what is going to be long term sustainable and what are the things that are basically going, going to have a hard time uh, because of these fundamental design challenges that they make. And in terms of major unlocks, I think some of the things are very, very obvious, right? Where, because stacks optimize for decentralization, uh, you don't get that high speed 
and the UX that you might get from uh, you know, newer blockchains like Solana, Avalanche, and so on. And we can, we can bring that to stacks. Like we, it is a trade-off between speed and decentralization. And a lot of these blockchains, they hide the fact that they are making that trade-off. Right? They will just give you the speed without fully admitting like, how, how centralized they have to become to be able to give you the speed. Right? So with hyperchains, what we're doing is we're just making it very, very explicit that if you want decentralization, you'll get slower speed on the main chain. If you want speed, you'll get less decentralization on the hyperchain. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people just go to the hyperchain and, and use it, and that's fine, right? Because uh, speed matters to them uh, more, more than anything else, which makes sense. But I think once we get that UX, like imagine people who try using Stacks applications today, it, you're running on Bitcoin block times, right? Like this is, this is a, a night and day difference between what can happen like on Solana and Avalanche today, but as soon as the hyperchains are live, I think that you would be completely at par with, with the type of UX and speed and capacity that you can add. I think that's going to be a major unlock. The second big one is obviously Bitcoin liquidity, right? Like uh, the, the biggest untapped market right now is the trillion dollars of Bitcoin capital. And by the way, that's trillion dollars today. If the world keeps going in the direction that it's going in and Bitcoin keeps winning, that's, that's likely going to be the largest pool of capital that humanity has ever seen, right? So imagine, like, like imagine if you could go back in time and you could be a developer or an entrepreneur when the internet was starting. The internet actually didn't have like direct financial applications, like people were actually building companies. But over here with Bitcoin, you're literally sitting at the start of the largest capital formation and the, and the, and the biggest reserve currency that humans have ever seen. And you have an opportunity right now to come in and try to build interesting things on top of it, right? So if you, if you think about it logically, like it's almost impossible to imagine that Bitcoin would keep accumulating capital but entrepreneurs and developers wouldn't come and try to do interesting things with it. Like that's, that's just logically, I, I don't think uh, that's possible. And I think working on really unlocking that liquidity and enabling a very native uh, connection where people can just send a Bitcoin transaction and move capital into Stacks contracts and, 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 and be, be able to like seamlessly use that would be, would be a major, major unlock. And can you give us a snapshot of, say, a year from now, um, what types of experiences would you love to see enabled for Bitcoiners? Yeah, I think the, uh, some of the stuff is actually pretty obvious and, and uh, low level hanging fruit, right? Like, so imagine that right now there's no, uh, no Bitcoin wallet out there, and this is something that you know, a bunch of people in our ecosystem are trying to change, where, where you have a Bitcoin wallet and you can just do a transaction and uh, go to a stable coin, right? Like imagine uh, the trading pair between BTC and stable coins is billions of dollars a day, right? If you look at the, what, what happens to Binance or Coinbase and so on, it's like billions of dollars of trading and it's growing. Like it's, it's on a curve where it's like actually growing. I personally feel fairly uncomfortable if I need to cash out to dollars, first transfer my BTC to an exchange, uh, they have various limits and then you are trying to withdraw uh, your stable coin out. And, an amazing UX experience would be that uh, you have your wallet, you have your multi-sig Bitcoin, and you just do a transaction and stablecoin shows up in your wallet. And then that stablecoin is secured by Bitcoin multi-sig, right? which is again something that Stack supports. Not a lot of people know about it, but these assets, like including STX, can be kept on Bitcoin multi-sig wallets and be moved around by just doing Bitcoin transactions. right? So in, in my mind, it's a little bit like, you, know, you get millions of users on, on a Bitcoin wallet, where they can uh, easily go to a stable coin, come back from a stable coin, they can start uh, purchasing NFTs, they can actually start having real use cases uh, for a lot of, like we are at a very, very early stage for NFTs as well, right? Like right now it's like digital art and only like a few types of things. But imagine like these things start reaching like massive audience and, and through Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin is the, is the brand name that a lot of people already are aware of. Like my, my parents know about it. A lot of people, like their, their grandparents would probably know about Bitcoin. And I think that's the thing that if you have uh, crossed a certain threshold of mainstream adoption, like that's the technology that basically like then cements itself, right? And I think uh, the work that we're doing would actually probably end up helping Bitcoin a lot because you can onboard a lot of people through fun ways like Bitcoin NFTs, probably more than, you know, just giving them like very serious Type, type of uh, wallets and interfaces to work with. So I, 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 I'm pretty excited about what, everything that can happen in the, in the next year and, and so on. Great. 
And what kinds of metrics do you think we should be looking out for beyond you know, total value locked, but thinking about Bitcoin longer term, um, what would you keep an eye on? That's a, that's a good question. So I think um, the best metric to think about is focusing on stacks first uh, would be the number of developers, right? Like how many, how many people are actively developing month over month, and is that number growing? Like are more and more people coming in? Because when developers come in, sometimes they uh, find roadblocks, right? So for example, you come in and you go like, hey, for my stable coin, this is a recent uh, example, I actually need uh, a bridge to Ethereum because I want to maintain that peg, right? But once that problem is solved for that developer, you know, like 10 other people can come in and now they, they can build. So, so tracking like the number of active developers, I think is a pretty, pretty interesting metric uh, for me. And the next thing is going to be obviously like what are people actually doing? Like, you know, are, are the uh, various smart contracts and application, do they have recurring use, right? So some uh, metrics would be, I think on the NFT marketplace, uh, STX NFT, there are something like 5,000 people who use it uh, regularly, right? And it would be great to kind of like see that number go to like 10,000, 100,000 and so on. That actually means that there's more organic traction uh, for, for that use case. And, and in our ecosystem, I do think that we, by design, and because it's so decentralized, there's so many different companies working on it, not like a, a, a single company that is throwing like marketing dollars or incentives at things. I do think like we have much more organic growth, uh, which might feel slower, but it's actually much more sustainable uh, in, in the long term, right? So if you have organic 5,000 users and it goes to like you know, 100,000 organic users, that's a lot in crypto. Versus, you know, let's say you're throwing incentives at people and they just come in for the incentives and as soon as the incentives dry out, they, they basically leave, right? So that's, that, those would be some of the short-term metrics that I'm interested in. On the very long term, I feel like uh, one metric that could mean that Stacks uh, ended up being massively successful would be the number of Bitcoin transactions, let's say like years out, five years out, 10 years out, something like that. The number of Bitcoin transactions that are actually triggered because of Stacks contracts overtake the Bitcoin uh, transactions that happen otherwise. That means that more people are interested in more complex use cases of Bitcoin than the simple transfer case. And I think that would just be like an amazing number where it's like, look, this, this thing was so powerful and people wanted to use like DeFi and other types of use cases so much that it is actually the dominant use case on, on, on the Bitcoin main chain. Absolutely. Now, we are in a group of stackers, um, so I'm curious, you know, everyone's sort of building this ecosystem together. Um, if you were to give sort of one um, call to action, what, what would you encourage folks to do? Yeah, so I think one, one thing that I'm uh, personally trying to do more is uh, take out a lot more time for writing. Uh, one thing I noticed is that uh, Vitalik, for example, I think did a great job at that. Like, uh, Vitalik was not running a company, so was not a day-to-day -day CEO of like any company, and actually had a lot more time to be able to put down thoughts as very detailed blog posts and, and sharing the ideas, right? And I, I do think like I personally want to do that a lot more, uh, because one thing that we have noticed is that our, our community is like so energized and so excited about what we're doing, but they're really hanging on to like bits and pieces of information like here and there, right? Like the, this, even the sector chat thing, it started very recently, and I, I've noticed like so many community members, they get their information from like these small sound bites, right? And then they try to uh, share their excitement for, for why this ecosystem is really good for Bitcoin or why they should be a, be a part of like something great early on. And I feel like being able to do that in long form writing uh, and helping kind of like the community like understand where we're going, uh, because this is this is a movement, right? And and in a, in a movement, you need to give people like clear ideas for like why you need to get buy-in like they, they have to logically agree with like yes this makes sense i'm excited about it and this is the direction i'm going in and here are all the details right here are the different pushbacks that people typically give and not and here are the reasons for why these, these design decisions were made right so in terms of the community i would say that we built something that uh, from a t technical perspective like very foundational it has very very solid foundations I do think that not a lot of people know about the project, right? Like we have a very, very enthusiastic, but relatively small community. So anything that we can do uh, to kind of like expand it, to unlock the next level uh, of like the people that we can uh, help introduce or uh, help kind of like, you know, create more content, more simpler 
uh, kind of like ways of describing you know, what we're doing, why this is important, and why you're excited about it. I think that can actually go a long way. But uh, one thing that I would, I would say is that a lot of people come to me and they tell me that the average uh, IQ level, <laughs> the average kind of like, you know, niceness level of this community uh, and how humble people are is actually like amazing, right? So as we try to grow, like one thing that we need to be careful of is that we're attracting kind of like people like us, right? So that we can maintain the culture of this community uh, even, even as, as we're growing it. And I think that would be, that'd be great to see because I'm pretty sure there are a lot more people like us out there who share the same beliefs that we do, but they currently basically just don't know uh, about what's, what's going on and, and why, why is it exciting. In the last 45 seconds, I guess in terms of, you know, elaborating a little bit further on the culture of building on Bitcoin, building DeFi on Bitcoin, what are like the three things that you would say our community sort of stands for? Our community stands for, I, I do think like the number one thing is the belief in Bitcoin, right? So like if, you, if you're not really sold, like if, if you haven't taken the orange pill, like you shouldn't take the purple pill, right? Like the orange pill like comes first. So once you, you're actually intellectually like sold that, hey, this is, this is something that's good for the world, uh, it's an open technology that is going to have a massive impact on this planet, and then you wanna, wanna be a part of it, I think that's, that, that's kind of like the, the first thing. I think the second thing is this uh, culture of being uh, intellectually curious and open to new ideas, which is something that the Bitcoin community had like back in the days, like 2013, 14, 15, even 16. Right, and, and then they lost it. So it's a little bit like a, of my uh, personal wish that I in, really enjoyed the intellectually curious Bitcoin community. And then over time, for various reasons, they've just become like shut down to new ideas. And I think Stacks is kind of like reviving that, right? Like they are intellectually curious people who are super interested in new ideas and they, and, and they kind of like support each other, right? Like some of the things are not gonna work. Some of the times the things are gonna break down. Like these things are hard. But, but it's a little bit like having a supportive community, like people who are excited about new ideas and who are supportive and who are there when something goes wrong, like I think that goes a long, long way, right? And I, I think that's a, that's a very, very good quality. And the third one, and I think it's a very important one, is being mission driven versus being uh, like, you know, in it for financial gains only or being mercenaries, right? A lot of the, the projects, especially the ones who put up a lot of incentives to attract like a lot of people like very, very quickly, they end up getting a lot of mercenaries, like who come in, who are there for like whatever they want, and then they leave, right? But being actually mission driven uh, just changes the game, right? Like I, like for me, like sometimes I think about, you know, uh, like what would I be doing in my life? Uh, I think I'll be working on exactly the same things even if I'm making zero money out of it, right? Like it's open source code, uh, it is something you believe in, it's something that's intellectually curious, and it keeps you like engaged and energized, right? So it's a little bit like if you ask yourself the question, that would I be doing what I'm doing if I get zero dollars out of it? If the answer is yes, that means that you're driven by the mission, right? And I think there's no better place to be than if you're just like fully driven by a mission that, that, that you believe in. Well, thank you everyone. That's a wrap. <laughs> Thanks so much.